To stand at the edge of the sea. To sense the ebb and flow of the tides. To feel the breath of a mist moving over a great salt marsh. To watch the flight of shorebirds that have swept up and down the surf line of continents for untold thousands of years. To see the running of the old eels and the young shad to sea is to have knowledge of things that are as nearly eternal as any earthly life can be. Rachel Carson wrote these words in Under the Sea Wind in 1941. And I often wonder whether they were running through my father's head when he stood with me in the salt marshes of northern France in the early years of the 1960s, watching migrating geese stream overhead while the rippling waves of Spartina grass hissed and bubbled with the incoming tide. It has proven impossible to extricate myself from the salt marshes ever since. We are mere months short of 60 years since Rachel Carson died. Her Sea Trilogy, especially The Edge of the Sea, still provides insight into the difference between anthropomorphism and allowing denizens of the non-human world to become the narrators in their own stories, and the importance of approaching an understanding of complex systems with humility. Her writing still highlights the intricate wonder of the salty edge habitats that have cradled more than just humanity. For salt marshes are the ever-changing edge habitat, a place of gentle breathing in and out of the land and the sea. We say, without thinking almost, that Mesopotamia was the cradle of civilization. That huge wetland delta of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, where fresh water and seawater mix in lush green profusion. Estuaries have always been where people gather. Cradle, the noun. The birthplace we first gathered in such numbers we made societies and cities. Cradle the verb. The functions of the habitat that feed us, clothe us, provide for us. It was not merely the easily accessed animal and plant resources that caused cities to arise, although these are the things we tend to think of when we think of estuaries everywhere. In the northern hemisphere and tropics, where salt marshes are dominated by grasses rather than chenopods, the tide provides the water to ensure reliable grazing. In the Camargue, the wetland delta of the Rhone, traditional guardians still ride the grey Camargue horses as they muster the free-ranging black cattle from the marshlands. Here in South Australia, the early settlers commented that the Ghana spent their time at the estuaries of the Patawalunga, the Onkaparinga and the Port River, catching and feasting on fish and shellfish and producing beautifully woven baskets from the wetland rushes and sedges. Bounteous indeed. The chemicals to preserve our food and make leather came from the salt marshes too. Early artisanal salt makers in the Mediterranean established salt making facilities that have evolved over centuries into the modern solar salt works of today. The physical and chemical knowledge of the process evolving in sophistication, while the people incorporated the rhythm of the salt making year into the festival cycles of their churches and communities. It wasn't that long ago that Matthew wrote, if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. He was thinking, no doubt, of the piles of salt left to weather on the shores of the Red Sea. Piles of coarse sea salt are bitter. A winter of weathering will wash out the bitter magnesium salts. But left too long, the common salt leaches away as well, leaving naught but gypsum. No use for pickling or bread making or tanning hides. South of Adelaide, we have the coastal lagoon of the Aldinga Washpool with its freshwater spring, its summer saltiness, and a warm shingle ridge. This was the place where the Ghana cured possum skins, ready for preparing exquisite cloaks. 
but estuaries provide more chemicals than just salt. Burning shore found lime was foundational to developing alkalis. Beach rock formed where groundwater and seawater mix, and the shells of mollusks, bivalves and echinoderms all make good burnt lime, which when hydrated makes the alkali calcium hydroxide. A surprising number of Adelaide's historic buildings are held together with mortar made from the lime obtained by burning oyster shells. Stripped first from the beds close by in the Port River, where La Talari's family were the custodians of the oyster beds near Hart's Mill. It wasn't long before oyster reefs disappeared from popular memory. Stronger alkalis are made from combining weaker alkalis. Wood ash contains potassium carbonate or potash. Combining it with burnt lime allowed the development of an alkali, potassium hydroxide, strong enough to make forest glass used in beads and glazes and some types of jellish, soft or black soaps. But those living in sheltered salt marshes in the estuaries could burn samphire that lived in salty water. That ash, called barilla, was rich in sodium carbonate or soda ash. The caustic soda that could be developed from soda ash allowed the glassmakers of Murano in the coastal lagoon of Venice to make crystal clear glass that could be used in windows as well as forming household glassware of unprecedented beauty. Despite the Doge's ruling that glassmakers could not leave the Republic of Venice on pain of death, quite a number did, heading to northern Europe where glass windows in castles and cathedrals were in high demand. They brought with them to England their knowledge of burning samphires to obtain barilla, and the name glasswort that we use today was born in the 16th century. Not much has changed for a long time. Alkalis were one of the first things settlers in Australia started looking for. Attempts to make barilla from a wide variety of coastal plants ensued. The plants that were used were mostly mangrove and shrubby samphire, as the smaller glasswort samphires have too little woody material and too much moisture to make burning practical. Mangrove stands around Adelaide as around the other capital cities, hosted rough and tumble mangrove burners operating in a dubious no man's land who chopped down swathes of forest to burn the trees. North of Adelaide, there is plenty of evidence of this period in the cut stumps of mangroves visible in the near shore at small settlements like St Kilda and Thompson Beach. Records suggest that mangrove burning also occurred in Spencer Gulf. It is always worth considering that the pristine mangrove forest or salt marsh you are studying may actually be regrowth. Time is an effective fog. What we know of the early days of settlement comes from the handwritten diaries of those who had the education and the time to write. And I suspect mangrove burners were not in that group. Reports of lumps of glass slag in the estuary of the Little Para south of St Kilda have led to the suggestion that glass may have been made there, close to Adelaide. While that is possible, most Australian glassmakers seem to have been using the imported Leblanc soda ash by the 1870s. But glass isn't the only thing you can make with soda. In Marseille in France, not far from that huge delta of the mouths of the Rhone, soap markets makers early discovered that you could make a hard soap with caustic soda derived from soda ash rather than the soft liquidy soap made by caustic potash. Bars of hard soap transport well, they're difficult to adulterate and they could carry the stamp of the maker. Savon de Marseille became a byword for cleaning power. Here in Australia, the poor quality soap made in the earliest days of European settlement improved rapidly once strong barilla produced by burning of mangroves and samphires, became available. Australian household scale soap makers may have been the largest market for the locally produced barilla. The sodium, magnesium, calcium and potassium sulfates, chlorides and carbonates obtained from coastal solar salt works find their way into almost everything we use. Plastics, detergents, paper, deodorants, even mag wheels. People have long turned their ingenuity to the task of extracting these base chemicals that form the foundation of the technological world we live in. 
But humans also turn to salt marshes for more than just stuff. Poets and artists have long found marshes to be a thin place. Eric Weiner said, a thin place was where the distance between heaven and earth collapses and we're able to catch glimpses of the divine. The heart yearns, wrote Sonoba Khan, for the salt of unsmelt air. Unswept thunderstorms. Unknown adventures. And as Sidney Lanier wrote in his poem, The Marshes of Glynn, And what if behind me to westward the wall of the woods stands high? The world lies east, how ample, the marsh and the sea and the sky. Of course, we are not the only species that depends on salt marshes. Food webs in healthy salt marshes are very diverse and complex. There are three main habitats within salt marshes and each provides a contribution to the salt marsh food web. The muddy benthic habitat is the production centre of the salt marsh and is where the detritus and slime from diatoms and cyanobacterial mats forms the basic foodstuff of the smallest animals, including grazing snails, small sea worms and tiny mud crabs. These in turn become food for fish, herons and egrets and the migratory shorebirds. The aquatic and benthic habitats overlap and small fish in the creeks and pans that provide food for the larger fish and hunting birds can actually reach the salt marsh during the highest tides of the month. During the highest tides of each month, the water from the creeks washes across the entire salt marsh and the little mud crabs release their zoe. The small fish from the creeks feast on these zoe and can potentially double their weight in a single tidal cycle. They then swim back out to sea and eventually into our fishing nets. Through the lower tides of the month, the creeks and the small pans hold sufficient water to support populations of small crustaceans and insect larvae. The aerial habitat is made up of the salt marsh vegetation growing above the muddy substrate. And this is the home of the insects, spiders, bats and birds. Sedge lands at the edges of our wetter salt marshes are home to rare butterflies and also predatory micro wasps, some of which turn out to be providing beneficial services to our horticultural industry by their predation on thrips. Small salt marsh birds like thornbills hop about the samphires looking for midges and other insects, while hunting birds like falcons catch lizards and snakes, herons and egrets fish the creeks, water birds graze on the inundated pans, and shorebirds feed on the invertebrate life of the mud. Shorebirds are essentially the top of the salt marsh um, food web and over 200 species of birds have been recorded in Wenatchee Nachi Pankara, the Adelaide International Bird Sanctuary. The Ghana name for the sanctuary means home of all the birds. Some birds remain here year round. However, there are many species that fly home each year from as far away as the Arctic Circle when the harsh northern winter bites. They rest and feed in the saltwater wetlands surrounding Barker Inlet and Gulf St Vincent. The sanctuary was declared to ensure these birds could continue their migrations. Now, as across the world coastal wetlands and marshes are being filled and drained, migratory birds are disappearing. Long distance migratory birds seen within Wenatchee Pankara include the red necked stint, curlew sandpiper, Eastern curlew, sharp-tailed sandpiper, bar-tailed godwit, black-tailed godwit, latham snipe, golden Pacific plover, marsh sandpipers and greenshanks. Migratory shorebirds need concentrated food supplies if they are to develop large enough fat reserves to allow them to fly to their northern breeding areas. The estuarine mudflats of the sanctuary contain a huge variety and number of the small marine animals and these Mud flats are used by the migratory shorebirds as their main feeding grounds at low tide, with the birds even feeding at night time. The adjacent salt marshes provide both food and rest during the period of each high tide. It appears they spend all their time eating or snoozing. 
Disturbances that cause them to lift off their feeding or roosting area use energy they can ill afford if they're to successfully make the journey north in May. They arrive back here in October, skinny little things, still carrying the tattered remnants of their breeding plumage and proceed to eat until they regain nearly 50% of their body weight. Wenachinachi Pankara is also an important wetland for birds that have smaller migrations. Banded stilts do not breed near Adelaide, although they feed here extensively. They breed on remote inland salt lakes, which only occasionally contain ample water. Black swans, black-tailed native hens and shell ducks often follow similar migration paths between inland and coastal Australia. Our shorebirds follow a route called the East Asian Australasian Flyway, and the route is protected under numerous international treaties. But treaties are of no use if the feeding grounds are damaged and the food sources are gone. Our flyway is not the only flyway. There are many such routes around the world. The geese I watched as a child were flying the African Eurasian Flyway. In 1966, two years after her death, and when my family and I were beginning our explorations of Australian salt marshes, the Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge was established on several land parcels along 80 kilometres of the east coast of Maine in the United States to preserve 10 important estuaries that are key points along the migration routes of waterfowl and other migratory birds. The reserve is a key site in the Atlantic Flyway, part of the larger Americas Flyway. Further south, the North Carolina Natural Estuarine Reserve System acquired several marshes and islands to create the Rachel Carson Coastal Reserve in 1989 for a similar purpose. Of course, climate change affects salt marshes. The insignificant looking salt marshes and cyanobacterial mats that drive the productivity of salt marshes play an important role, however. They sequester carbon at remarkable rates. The carbon that salt marshes, mangroves and seagrass meadows sequester tends to be very stable. As the salt prevents methogenesis, preventing the stored carbon from decomposing and releasing greenhouse gases. But is blue carbon, as it is termed, significant? Most studies show that carbon burial rates in salt marshes, mangroves and seagrass meadows is at least an order of magnitude more than sequestration in forests. But is that enough? We know from the Azolla event 49 million years ago, when fresh water floated on top of salty Arctic seas and billowing blooms of the Azolla water fern lived, died and fell through the salt layer to deposit the hydrocarbons we are currently burning, that even insignificant looking plants can change the world. They did. Over a twinkling 800,000 years, their floating 4 million square kilometre meadows caused an 80% drop in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and 5 degrees of cooling, allowing large mammals to evolve. Now that we have re-released quite a belch of that carbon, we will need more than just cessation to turn the warming around. The living edges of the land and sea, the salt marshes, mangroves and seagrass meadows, will be an essential partner in the struggle to re-stabilise the climate of our shared home. Many have commented that Rachel Carson wrote her love letters to the sea with barely a mention of the global catastrophe currently facing us. The truth is, the 30s through to the 50s were too early for the globally collected data that she would have needed to be able to pull a string to unravel the issues of ocean acidification, marine heat waves and sea level rise. Hawaii's Mauna Loa Observatory, our longest record of atmospheric carbon dioxide, only has measurements as far back as 1958. The first tiniest evidence for rising sea surface temperatures was in the 1970s, and we were busy with an ozone hole to address. Yet, in 1951, in The Sea Around Us, when talking of how ocean currents circulate energy and water to regulate the 
Earth's climate, she wrote, but for the present, the evidence that the top of the world is growing warmer is to be found on every hand. And by the 60s, she wrote in an unpublished note, we live in an age of rising seas. In our own lifetime, we are witnessing a startling alteration of climate. She died before she could begin to unpick the swelling of the seas, but she left us with maybe a thread to pull to find an answer to the deep question of how we may address not only the climate crisis, but all the planetary systems we have stretched to breaking point, all the planetary boundaries we are crossing. She urges us to approach the world around us in a spirit of discovery with an open inquiring mind with wonder and humility. For wonder and humility, said Carson, do not exist side by side with a lust for destruction. When faced with a disastrous wave of easily developed and applied toxic chemicals, Carson had urged us to work with nature to put aside our Neanderthal philosophy of control of nature and rethink ourselves as partners in the web of life. We stand now, she said, where two roads diverge, but unlike the roads in Robert Frost's familiar poem, they are not equally fair. The road we have long been travelling is deceptively easy, a smooth superhighway on which we progress with great speed, but at its end lies disaster. The other fork of the road, the one less travelled by, offers our last, our only chance to reach a destination that assures the preservation of the earth. The less travelled road in front of us now, at the closing of the first quarter of the 21st century, may be rocky indeed. But even the roughest of journeys goes better with company, and we have the whole world travelling with us on this one. Failure is not an option, lest we end up inhabiting a world where, as Keats wrote, the sedge is withered from the lake, and no birds sing. Thank you.